so blessed by you customers um, and, and your enthusiasm for us. But um, a few things real quick. We will be recording this event and later host and posting it onto YouTube, um, but have no fear. Only the people in the little yellow box who are unmuted uh, will be recorded and having their, um, their sound on it will be appearing there. So um, let me hand things over to my wonderful colleague, colleague Rachel. Um, hi, everybody. I'm the event manager for Northshire Bookstore's Saratoga Springs, New York location, which means that I get to see our guest authors tonight quite often. Um, I want to say a quick thank you to our great friends at MLK Saratoga who've helped us with the word about this event this evening. Um, we are co-sponsoring MLK Saratoga's presentation um, with the amazing author Jewel Parker Rhodes, which is being hosted by Yaddo tomorrow, January 16th at 7 p.m. Um, you can register for that event at yaddo.org and it's well worth attending. It's going to be another great one. Um, tonight, I get the huge honor of welcoming Joseph Bruchef to Northshire Live. Um, Joe has written more than 120 books for children, teens, and adults. Um, he's one of the most prolific writers I know. He's won more awards than you can shake a stick at, countless awards and honors for all of his work. Um, he's also a really longstanding friend of Northshire. When we opened the Saratoga store back in 2013, he was one of the very first authors in town to reach out and say, how can I help? Um, he's also the founder of the Indochina Education Center in Greenfield which is an incredible uh, cultural and environmental resource right here on our doorstep. And he's with us here tonight to talk about his recent book, One Real American. Tonight, Joe is going to be interviewed about his book by fellow author, Steve Schenken. Um, back in 2017, Joe interviewed Steve at Northshire for the launch of Steve's book, Undefeated. And it was a memorably wonderful evening in the store. I'm really thrilled that we could bring these two great writers back together again. Please join me in welcoming them back to Northshire Live. Thank you. Yeah, that was 2017. Wow. Thanks for the rematch. Yeah, that's when we could go outside. Remember that? <laughs> that was awesome. Yes. So, all right, let's just jump right in. This this book, One Real American, The Life of Elias Parker. Um, what a life. What a life. Um, you know, it, it spans the century, practically, the, the, the 19th century. Um, it, but you start... With, uh, with one scene, it kind of in the middle. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a famous scene at, at Appomattox Courthouse. So everyone kind of remembers or knows that part of the history. That's where they signed the surrender. You know, Grant and Lee met together, but, but Parker was there too and played a central role. So could you just start with, with that story and talk about why you, why you began there? Well, it's such a wonderful story. It actually gave me the title to the book, One Real American. And I'll say another word or two about that title in a minute. But what occurred was that at the Appomattox Courthouse, Grant had his personal staff present for the signing with Lee of the surrender of Lee's army. And one of the people with him was Ely S. Parker, who was himself a Seneca Indian and had become a brevet general and was Grant's personal secretary because quite frankly, of all the people on Grant's staff, the only truly literate one who could read and write well was ironically, Ely Parker, who was Native American. So when the time came to write out the terms of the surrender, someone else on Grant's staff was supposed to do it, but his hand was shaking so much, he <laughs> tore up one paper after another. And he finally said, Parker, you have to do it. So Parker himself wrote out the terms of surrender. But backing up just a few minutes before that, when Lee arrived, he was introduced one by one to the members of Grant's staff. He paused for a moment when he saw this swarthy skinned man in front of him. Maybe it was going through his mind that this was a, a person of African descent, an irony uh, or even an insult, but then he realized. And I think a smile came over his face because what he said was, it's good to see one real American here. To which Parker replied, we're all Americans, General. Now that moment, to me, that idea that we are all Americans is something we need to hear right now, today in this country. And so I could not be happier to have chosen that title, One Real American, because of all the things it implies. Beautiful, we're done, thanks. My pleasure. <laughs> uh, all right, so I mean, let's step back now because he, he uh, once you read the book, you think, well, this guy should be one of the most famous Americans, but he's not. Let's, um, let's just introduce him. Can you talk just a little bit about Parker and, and an overview of what makes him so amazing? 
Well, he was born, of course, in the Seneca Nation. What was left of the Seneca Nation after the Revolutionary War, the Seneca people, the people of the Great Hill, had been driven out of much of their land and had only remaining a few small reservations in Western New York. And even those small reservations were under siege because the Ogden Land Company wanted that to build upon. In fact, managed to take the Buffalo Creek Reservation where most of the city of Buffalo then was built and took it through uh, a deed that turned out to an agreement that turned out to have been completely forged. Not one signature on it was real, but because by the time that was proven in court, white people had already moved onto the land. They said, well, it's too late now. We can't give it back to you. So at that time, when the Haudenosaunee people had been uh, stripped of their military power, had become a minority people in their own land, they needed to have representatives, people who could speak for them, people who understood the white man's language and the white man's writing as well as the white man did. And so they chose some of the brightest of their young people to go to school. And Ely Parker, who was at that time known as Hasa Nawanda, or actually became known as Hasa Nawanda, or the reader or the open book, was chosen to be one of those to go to school. He went to school, not without difficulty managed indeed to get an excellent education so that by the time he was in the equivalent of high school, he was giving speeches in front of his entire school, all of whom were white Americans. He was the only Native American in those schools that he ended up going to. He then went on to serve as a representative for his people, visiting Albany to see the governor, visiting Washington, D.C. to see one president after another to try to prevent the loss of their land to the Ogden Land Company. And he spent most of his years as a, a young man, a teenager into his young adult years, serving as a representative for his people. And in fact, he and the indomitable Seneca Nation, the Tonawanda Senecas, managed to prevent their reservation from being taken against the greatest of odds. So he was a man who was already moving in his teens and his 20s among the highest level politically in the United States. He was friends and acquaintances with every president of his time, which is pretty amazing. He then went on after having succeeded in that role to be given the role to be raised up as um, a rodeon or a chief, a named man, a person who now was one of the leaders of his people, chosen by the women of his clan as was done traditionally. And he was given a new name. He was Tony Hogawa, Tony Hogawa, who was the keeper of the western door of the longhouse. If you picture the League of the Iroquois, the original five nations, as the shape of a longhouse, to the east were the Mohawks who kept the eastern door, to the west, the Senecas who kept the western door, then in between, the Cayugas, the Oneidas, and then in the center, the Onondagas, who were the keeper of the council fire. So this is what he did by the time he was in his early 20s. He had met every president of his time, he had been a representative of his people, and he had now become a chief. He began studying law very successfully. Everyone was sure he would become a lawyer, but apparently because he was not a citizen and no American Indian or Native American, whatever term you want is okay, could be a citizen at that time. And so he was unable to get his law degree. He then got a job working on the uh, Erie Canal and parts of the Erie Canal he got that job through a man named Lewis Henry Morgan. I need to back up again. <laughs> Lewis Henry Morgan met Ely Parker in a bookstore in Albany, of all places, and recognizing him as Native American was thrilled because Morgan himself was fascinated with Indians and wanted to write about them. And Ely Parker became quite literally his co-writer and the book that Parker and he put together, which was credited to Morgan, but also acknowledged by Morgan as being Parker's gift to him, was called The League of the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois, which is the seminal and first book of American ethnology, a book that had tremendous influence. In fact, Morgan's writings influenced none other than the founders of the Communist Party. People like Marx read Lewis Henry Morgan. So there's another interesting connection. Um, Parker then went on, as I said, to work on the Erie Canal and he worked his way up and became an engineer, entirely self-taught learning on the job and was hired by the United States government to work as a civil engineer for the government and sent to Illinois 
to Galena, Illinois, to build a uh, customs house, which is still standing and other buildings. And he became friends with a young man who was a former soldier in the Mexican-American War, now uh, kicked out of the army because they downsized after that war. That man's name was Ulysses S. Grant. And he and Parker became close friends, a friendship that lasted pretty much through their entire life. Uh, that's just uh, the first uh, 40 years of his life leading up to the time when the Civil War happened. So you can see very eventful, very unique, and a man who was truly a genius in many ways. Yeah, I mean, it's true. It is amazing. It's, um, and it, I, 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 as you were talking, I think I came up with a theory for my next question, um, of the answer. But I mean, you, you've written a lot of books in many different formats, but some of my favorites are, are historical, but they're fiction because you've taken say Jim Thorpe or the a Navajo code talker and written their story very faithfully with research, but in a voice that, that was fictional yes. that you created. You didn't ch choose to do that here. And I wanted to ask why, and just as you were talking, I think I might know, but um, what did you think about it? Did you, did you, was there any struggle or did you know right away? This well, is I have to confess, I already wrote a novel about him as a young man called Walking Two Roads. It was published two years ago, and that was a novelization of his life. I've written an unproduced screenplay about Ely Parker, and I have been, I wrote a whole series of poems in his voice that was published um, a few years ago. So I've been working on Parker, if you could call it working, when you're getting to know someone, it becomes like a collaboration for more than 20 years. And I thought right now, and I have to say that, and I'm not just saying this because we're buddies, I'm inspired by the work that you do in bringing historical fiction to young audiences. I think it's very, very important, a noble thing to do, quite frankly. And so I thought, I want to write something in that genre that will be absolutely truthful. And that will be the story told without my embellishment or creating any episodes or events so that people would learn about a truly amazing person who should be better known and who, and I think this is inspiring, succeeded against all odds because backing up in his story. Before he was born, his mother had a dream and dreams among indigenous people are very powerful. We often regard them, I do personally, as messages from beyond ourselves. And in that dream, his mother saw a rainbow arching from the uh, Indian traders home all across the native land and ending up in the city of the Europeans. And that rainbow had writing that she couldn't read, she was illiterate, and it had a break in the center. And she went to the dream speaker among the Haudenosaunee, there are those whose job it is to interpret dreams. This is well before Freud. <laughs> and uh, she was told that the dream meant she would have a son who would be great among both the whites and the Indians. He would leave their land, but return in the end to his people and that his path would be broken at its greatest height. And indeed that happened to Ely Parker on several occasions when he tried to become a lawyer. Later on, he lost his job as an engineer because a new president came in and those who were part of the old party, like Parker, who had actually spoken in favor of the defeated candidate for president were kicked out of their office. Uh, he went on again to uh, have a position in Grant's administration and there too, it ended in a, a situation where he found himself court-martialed for supposedly misusing funds was found innocent, but that ended his career in Grant's administration. He then went on to become quite successful on Wall Street as an investor and a man who he uh, suretyed for, who he signed for, who he agreed to, to back, uh, embezzled a huge amount of money, left the country. And Parker was told, uh, you don't have to repay it even though you signed for him because you're a Native American, you're not bound by those laws of white men. And Parker's response was, I am a man before I am anything else. And he repaid all that money, but basically bankrupted himself. So again and again throughout his life, he reached this high point, it would be broken. And yet his indomitable will saw him through it, he would rise again. And uh, that's another thing that uh, I thought was too good to be fiction. The truth of it is so powerful. That was my theory too, that, that it's too good to be fiction. And also it's too much to be fiction. I know. It would be like, you're trying to do a Dickensian thing, you know, in a very cliched way. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. It would just be too much. Mm -hmm. 
And there are other chapters that Joe hasn't even mentioned yet that, that are just amazing. I like there's, there's a scene, I'm always looking for those scenes, you know, those little moments that, that mean so much and, and that, that impact a person. And you describe one when he's about 12, he's walking home, he's walking alone, I believe, and he runs into some English soldiers Mm -hmm. And they sort of, they tease him, not realizing that he speaks some English. He's not fluent yet, but speaks some English. And you describe that as a very pivotal moment for him. Oh, there's no doubt about that. In fact, uh, on the, in the book, it's on page uh, 46 and 47, where he talks about spending two years in Canada, learning traditional skills he couldn't learn on the Tonawanda reservation because the fish were gone. The game was gone. Everything had been, basically the forests were gone. So he had to learn those traditional skills by going to Canada and then walk back from the area around Brantford, Ontario to Tonawanda. It took several days. Now it's like three or four hours by car, even not counting the border crossing. But he fell in with a group of British officers who made fun of him. He wrote, and he was a good writer. It was natural that these officers should amuse themselves in some way to pass the time and tedium of travel. This they did at my expense. They all the time being under the impression that I did not understand or know the point of their jokes, but he did. So much so that he determined he would go back to school, that he would never again be in a position where he would be unable to defend himself verbally, to actually outspeak those who tried to put him down as those officers did. So it was a pivotal point in his life. And actually before that, before he had gone to Canada, he had been asked to uh, translate from the English of the minister into his own language. And he got up in front of the audience of his own people and he was so nervous and he got so tongue tied trying to translate the difficult English language that he fainted dead away. Hmm. And uh, you know, those kinds of things are pivotal points in anyone's life when you are not able to succeed or you feel thwarted. And you can either give up or you can use it as an inspiration to do better. In fact, I always tell kids, if someone tells you you cannot do something, then don't believe them. Don't believe them. Don't believe you can't do it until you've at least tried your best. Yeah, there's, there's just so many moments that are fascinating. I, I don't want to just tell. And here's another great thing. Here's another great thing because you'll read the book and you'll see you'll see what we're talking about. Um, was this a story that the, the Parker story? Was it something you knew? Did, did you learn this story as a as a kid? Did you know it? Um, I have to say that I really first became aware of it um, after I had been to college. After I spent three years of teaching in Africa, I came back to the United States around 1969. And I began visiting a friend of mine, a man named Hannah Dolans or Ray Fadden, a Mohawk elder who founded something called the Six Nations Iroquois Museum in Anchoyota, New York. Whenever I visited Ray's museum, I learned things. And one of the things I learned was about this man, Ely Parker, who Ray held in such high esteem, who I knew nothing about at the time. I mean, there I was, you know, on my way to getting a PhD, and I had no idea who this great American was. I, I'm a little ashamed of that now. Although I also blame our education system for not making it more possible for us to learn about the great women and the great men who have been so forgotten until recent years and are being rediscovered and put forward uh, with often books like yours and mine. So uh, that was when I began. So I would say I've only spent about 40 years learning about Ely Parker, but I didn't know about him until I was in my 30s. Yeah, and you talk a little bit about, well, in the, in the end, if you're a, a, a nonfiction nerd like me, you look at the source notes, you look at the acknowledgments. Yeah. And, and so, so Parker wrote very well, as you say, and pretty extensively. He had, was it a grand nephew who wrote about him as well? Yes, actually, it was his grand nephew. It was Arthur C. Parker, who was the son of uh, his uh, brother, of uh, Ely Parker's brother. Okay, and, and those were the best, would you say those were the, the, mo the best sources? Those were the best sources, Parker's own writing himself, and of course the military records, and then the writing of uh, Arthur C. Parker, who was a very prolific person himself, and one of the founders of the New York State Museum. And, as, and you went also, ta you talked to people as well, and, and Seneca, 
people who who knew the story as well and got that that version as well of, that, of the story. Is that right? Yes, I also believe that it's important when it's at all possible for us to see the places where these things yeah. happen. You know, you know what I mean, don't you? Exactly. You write about Benedict Arnold. You've never been to the Saratoga battlefield. You're a jerk. <laughs> you know, but uh, <laughs> but the thing was, I found uh, from the people themselves, from the enduring traditions of the Haudenosaunee people, which Parker himself wrote about. And uh, I have to say that he was the primary source for a lot of the knowledge about who and what the Iroquois people were for, um, for generations. And of course, he's only one person in one family to think he knew it all would be incorrect. And Morgan's book, uh, The League of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois is a little limited because it relies so much just on Ely Parker's family. That said, it's an amazing, magnificent book for its time. So he was amongst many other things. He, uh, we know about, we talk a little bit about the Civil War working directly for Grant and, and then worked on reconstruction as well. Seemed very passionately committed to oh, the very definitely. of reconstruction. Did he ever talk about slavery before the Civil War? Did that, was that something he had to deal with in his, in his life, his working life? Did it come up? I don't think it came up as much as it would have had he been living in the South. Because, yeah. of course, remember, he lived out his life on the reservation and in western New York, which was relatively a free zone. It's no wonder that so many great figures um, in American history, women, for example, like uh, Harriet Tubman, um, so as Runa Truth passed through there because this was the route of the Underground Railroad. So he was aware of it and during the Civil War, deeply aware of it. He was committed to fighting in the Civil War because he was opposed to slavery and tried to, re to enlist many times before he finally, in fact, he was told this is a white man's war because everybody was sure it would be over in a short period of time. And of course it wasn't. Eventually he was called in to serve. And after the war, he was such a passionate believer in the cause of African-American liberation and continued liberation that he invested most of his money in something called the Freedmen's Bank. It's a story that should be better told because it was one of the things in a reconstruction that was basically destroyed from within. Uh, white men took advantage of the Freedmen's Bank and embezzled money from it, uh, basically destroyed it. And uh, Parker lost a lot of money by being a, a major investor and a major supporter of that bank that was meant to uh, provide capital, working capital for freed slaves and to rebuild the American South with African-Americans being a central part of that rebuilding. Wow. All right. Now, middle grade, I would call this a middle grade book, wouldn't you? It's yeah, uh, publishing it has these categories. Right? And one of the things in middle grade, we usually don't talk a lot about people's love lives. Oh, yeah. Because kids <laughs> don't care about that at that age. So, and it gets dicey anyway. But but it's important in his story because yes. when he, he was dating someone, I don't know what the, it would seem like the equivalent of early high school, maybe at the Yates school. Uh, he yes. dated a white woman and it yeah. was it was quite a, a stir it was a big stir as a matter of fact uh, what he did was he hired a carriage and uh, at a certain date drove past the school with her in the carriage with him which was a real talk of you know everyone was horrified because you see in those days you have to understand even here in the north if you were african-american and if you were native american you were both called colored you were both viewed as on the other side of the color barrier. So for someone white to uh, be seen with someone who was Native American, educated and cultured as he was, was regarded as uh, maybe shameful. And that young woman, her parents quickly whisked her off for a tour to Europe as soon as that event was over where Parker escorted her to a school event. And then later on, you know, when he was uh, a grown man and serving in Brant's administration, he um, became involved with a, a young woman who was sort of the belle of Washington, D.C. And there is a fairly legitimate story that there were plans to assassinate him on the part of jealous white men before the wedding. Uh, he never showed up at the wedding. She was left standing at the church. And uh, he showed up several days later and, and told the story of how he had been drugged by another Indian who did not want him to marry a white woman and uh, they reset their date of marriage and everybody showed up at the church and they weren't there 
because they'd been married the night before with uh, Grant giving the bride away because the bride's uh, father had died in the Civil War. And uh, they lived out the rest of their lives together until he passed on. And she was, uh, she was famously quoted as saying, I didn't marry him because he was an Indian. I married him because I loved him. And that was uh, all there was to it. Apparently, she was a very strong-willed young woman and, and uh, knew who it was she wanted to be with. And apparently, they had a very uh, happy relationship. And they did have one child late in his life, a daughter. And I actually have a picture of him. In yeah, there's a book beautiful, you should check out, if you, if you ha take a look at the book, there's a beautiful picture of him and his daughter. And it, it's just, it's, it's a very touching story. And by that time, I mean, just to add yet another, you wouldn't believe it if someone made it up chapter. He's working, he was working at the New York, for the New York City Police. Yes, yes. After he lost most of his fortune, uh, he uh, had connections in the police department. And Fred Grant, who was Ulysses S. Grant's son, was the head of the New York State, uh, excuse me, the New York City Police Department where they had this new guy named Theodore Roosevelt working in the police <laughs> department too. Uh, so there's Ely Parker uh, right there in the police department. And people kept coming to the police department to see him. Famous people, Jacob Reese, who was a famous writer at the time, came to see him. Uh, sculptors came to, uh, to carve busts of him because they regarded him as the most famous Native American of his time, even though he's pretty much forgotten to the public now. He was very famous and also was well, um, well known as a speaker. He spoke to audiences of the Grand Army of the Republic and people who were interested in the Civil War again and again, telling the stories of his experience and telling the story of, uh, of Grant, who he was uh, loyal to, even though in later years they did not see each other that much. When Grant passed on, Ely Parker was one of the pallbearers. Yeah, there's even a story where he he seems to have saved Grant's life, right? Didn't did they got Grant sort of got lost at one point? This is dirt back now, back during the the Civil War. Yeah, yeah um, as a matter of fact, what happened is they were riding along, and uh, I have this in the book on page one fifty one, right. and uh, Ely says to uh, Rollins, who is one of Grant's aides. If the general doesn't look out, he will be in the rebel lines. Rollins immediately called out to General Grant. Hey, General, do you know where you are? <laughs> Grant stopped his horse. No, he said. He looked at the man leading them. Comstock, do you? No, answered Comstock. <laughs> Ely and Rollins have by now ridden up to Grant's side. Parker says, if you don't look out, we'll ride plumb into the rebel lines, Rollins said. Grant turned to Ely. Parker, he said, do you know where we are? Yes, General, Ely replied. Grant then quickly said, well then lead. I put spurs to my black horse and galloped off in another direction and they full tilt after me. Now, this is a direct quote from his own writing right here, word for word. After the battle, I met a rebel captain whom we had captured. He said to me, Colonel, I wish to ask you about a certain incident. The other day I saw General Grant with General Meade and a party of which you were one riding into our lines. My men wanted to fire on you, but I said, hold on, they will ride in and we can capture the whole lot. Then I saw you ride up and say something to Grant and your whole party galloped off in haste. You were within 40 rods of us. We hope to get you all in the next five minutes. Great story. Yeah, that could have changed too. Could have changed, changed things pretty dramatically right there. And then, I mean, sometimes you have, that's a perfect scene. You don't have to make up anything. And then sometimes you have moments where I'm just talking as a nonfiction writer now. You're like, oh, I wish I knew a little bit more about that. There are moments, he, of course, he meets everybody. I think the first president that, that he meets is Polk, maybe, and he was 16. Yes, that's right. He knew Teddy president. Roosevelt. And he knew yeah. Dolly Madison, who was, you know, uh, James right. Madison's wife, and she was on friendly terms with him. <laughs> it's incredible. And, and of course, right in the middle is Abraham Lincoln. And mm -hmm. he, he, he met with, Lincoln a couple of times, including the, the day that Lincoln went to the, the play, right? The very right. last- In fact, he almost went to the play with him and regretted apparently all his life that he didn't because um, he wished as did many people he could have been there. And uh, he and Lincoln had deep conversations while Lincoln was visiting City Point, which was their headquarters in the war, uh, about what could be done following the Civil War 
in terms of relations with Native Americans, which was a huge issue because of course the longest warfare, the longest war the United States ever fought was a series of Indian wars beginning at the birth of the Republic and continuing all the way until the end of the 19th century. And during Parker's time working for Ulysses S. Grant, Grant proceeded to follow what was called Grant's peace policy. And there were very few of the incidents with Native Americans that had happened in the years following or the years before while Parker was in that role in Grant's administration. Yeah, so do you think there was a chance there for things to have gone differently if, if his ideas had been listened to by other presidents? I think so. I think there's no question about it because the thing that got uh, Parker in trouble why he lost his position was that uh, they had promised, most treaties, treaties promised certain things, that people would be fed on this one reservation of Lakota people. But the food was not showing up and people were on the verge of rebellion. They were ready, as they used to call it in those days, to break out, to go out and to engage in warfare again, to raid uh, and to you know, cause great difficulty and death. And Parker proceeded to approve the selling of supplies without going through the right channels because he knew it would take weeks to go through the right channels. And people who were jealous of him because he was an Indian in that position brought him up on charges. He was court-martialed and found to be innocent. But it was, they put it this way, it was either feed or fight. There was no other choice, feed or fight. And he chose to feed. So you have, I mean, when you sit down to write, You've done a lot of research. Would you say this was a relatively easy book to research because there was, the life was so eventful or did that actually make it harder? I didn't say it was an easy book to research. I, I probably should have said it was a book that I've been researching for 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, a lot of the stuff I already knew and I just had to go back and recheck my facts. And I think that if you look at anything that you've really immersed yourself in, uh, you think you know it, but then you start working on it, you realize, oh, wait a minute, I know it, but in a broad sense, I wanna know it in a very particular sense. So all those little details, again, you and I, as writers of uh, historical nonfiction, know how important those small details are and how getting those details wrong can completely take the veracity out of your work. One wrong thing, one mistake, one in indication that you don't know what you're talking about, and a good reader seeing that is going to lose faith in you. Mm -hmm. I know I've personally lost faith in some writers who I won't name because I've found they've done sloppy research. They have things happening that did not happen or they have details that were um, anachronistic or unlikely or impossible, <laughs> like having you know hedgehogs in North America, <laughs> which are not found in North America. They're found in Europe and England, but there are no hedgehogs in, in the Northeast. So, you know, read a book with a hedgehog. Oh, dear me. This is science fiction. <laughs> yeah, I have that experience. I know exactly what you mean. Did you, so you, you've known about this story for a long time. And, and like you say, I've written other, other pieces about other stories about Parker. Did you, was there anything new when, when you came at this to write this particular book? Was there anything and you said, huh, I never thought of it that way, or I, I, never, I never realized that. I think as I wrote it, I saw more and more how the arc of his life had those moments where he had, he suffered great reversals that would have crushed another person. And that became more obvious to me in writing the book than it had been um, in previous years. I think, as you know, when you put everything together, it's not just all the pieces, it's like the whole thing itself. It's like a book of poetry is not a group of poems. It becomes something solid when all those poems are put together. So too, nonfiction, when all those facts are put together, suddenly I think sometimes some larger picture begins to emerge that you may not have consciously been aware of. Maybe your subconscious was, and that's why you've structured it that way. But the conscious awareness often comes partway through and sometimes even close to the end of completing a book such as this. And I've heard you talk about him as, as an inspiration. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that, what you, what you mean? Well, I think Parker is an inspiration for some of the reasons I've already mentioned, that he had that ability to be resistant, resourceful, and re resilient, to come back 
in the face of what seemed like overwhelming odds. The fact that he spoke for people who were largely forgotten, it's been my honor to be able to speak for my Abenaki people, our Abenaki nation, and to, to see my sons take that up and see my son, Jesse, actually teaching our language, which was in danger of extinction only a, a decade or so ago because of his work and other people's work. It seems that it's beginning to once again um, thrive. So I, I think that that's one thing I, I found from Parker, that ability to immerse himself in a cause, to fight for his people, to be a person who did not give up. I find all those things uh, deeply inspiring. And I try to emulate uh, some of those better qualities. I don't always succeed, <laughs> but uh, I also love his sense of humor. The fact that in, in spite of all those things, the sense of humor keeps creeping through. There's this wonderful story how near the end of his life, he uh, uh, was uh, selling some of the things off in his, uh, his house in Connecticut and uh, he had quite a library. And he found some of his regalia as he was looking through all old trunks. And so he put it on. And then he decided to get a book off the shelf and he climbed up on the ladder to get a book off the shelf just at the moment when the local minister showed up to uh, try to see if he could you know, purchase one of Ely's books, which was a book of sermons, I think, by someone. And uh, he walked into the study and seeing Ely on the ladder, he later went, ah! and ran out and, and you got the sight of a savage Indian lurking, leaping up. So uh, it's a great scene. I, I just find myself laughing every time I think of it. That's funny. There, there's, there, I love those moments too that make you realize we haven't changed very much where, where um, there's this, you would think such a solemn moment where they're signing and you can going back to the beginning now where Grant and Lee are signing Oh yeah, Lee is signing this surrender, which is the biggest moment in American history to this point. And, and then as soon as they're done, people start grabbing stuff. I know. It's not nailed down. They start they're grabbing souvenirs. George Armstrong Custer went running in and grabbed the writing desk and made off with it. <laughs> so they can sell it on eBay. Yeah, that's what he would have done. Yeah, it's, uh, they cut down the tree they were sitting under to, to take it up into pieces. pieces. <laughs> Um, and it wasn't even their tree. It was a tree that belonged to the person whose house it was. That's the thing is they were someone's personal private house. Imagine something happening if you had a house and all of a sudden all these vultures come sweeping in and strip the house of all its contents for souvenirs. That's kind of what happened. To them. Uh, so it's an amusing sort of sidelight on history to, to yeah. see those little details. Are there other... I mean, Parker is such a, is a giant, really. Um, but I mean, are there other people out there who, there's no story like it, but who's, who's, who's also lesser known, uh, maybe a lesser known story that, that you've got your eye on? They say, I want people, to, people should know about this person too, or someone that you've come across. Well, there is an event in American history that I'm starting to work on for the same publisher. Okay. And uh, the working title is Of All Tribes, and it's a story of the Native American takeover of Alcatraz yeah. in 1969. And uh, it looks at how, the history of Alcatraz, the history of California, how it ties into Native American history in general. And what's interesting is I've been working on this project and it's, it's a year or two away from being completed, is that I discovered so many people I know were at Alcatraz, personal friends of mine, people I've been encountering and in touch with over the years, Wilma Mankiller, who became the principal chief, the first woman chief of the Cherokee. Grace Thorpe, the daughter of, <laughs> of Jim Thorpe, was at Alcatraz. And the list just goes on and on. And it has a deep connection to Akwesasne, to the Mohawk Nation, and to the White Roots of Peace, the people who told the story of the League of the Haudenosaunee and the creation of the League. And, and this all tied into the sort of um, reason and philosophy behind the takeover of Alcatraz on the part of the native people who did it. So it's a rich and a deep story. And in working on it, there are several people, I won't bother mentioning them right now, whose stories are gonna be central to this. And I find myself, uh, again, uh, learning things as I go along, even though I thought I knew a lot about it, I'm uh, constantly uh, finding out things. There's this wonderful, lovely little details, like the fact that uh, the Indians in Alcatraz had their own boat, which was given them by Credence Clearwater Revival. And they named the boat the Clearwater and they used it to go back and forth between San Francisco and Alcatraz. 
That's awesome. So that'll be another similar format, a middle grade. It'll be a similar format, lots of uh, photographs. And uh, I am working with the same editor at Howard Reeves at uh, the uh, Abrams Publishing to work yeah. on this new title. Hopefully you can get out there soon to uh, to, to poke around. Have you, you must have been there over the I've years. I've been to Alcatraz many times and I have a funny Alcatraz story if I can throw this in right now. Um, my son, Jim, uh, has traveled all around the country and he used to have a, a friend, a woman friend who was a park ranger on Alcatraz. She was Native American, she is Native American and they're still good friends, but no longer you know, dating each other. But she said when he was out there, how would you like to spend the night at Alcatraz? You know, a few people can do this every night if the permission is to the parks department, we invite someone. So he said, cool. So she set him up in a cell in Alcatraz with a cot and uh, he went to sleep and woke up halfway through the night seeing this ghostly figure rise up through the floor and kind of wobble in front of him and then sink back down in again. Jim said, yep, ghost, went back to sleep. I mean, this is, this is Jim. <laughs> so he told that story. Everybody loved it because it's a story where one of the people who tried to uh, take over Alcatraz in the armed assault when a group of inmates got guns was killed in that very cell and died there. So fast forward about five years and I'm visiting Alcatraz and the guide is showing us around because this cell here is where so-and-so died in the Alcatraz takeover. You know, we had a Native American sleeping here one night and he saw a ghost. <laughs> I raised my son. That was my son. <laughs> oh, man. That's you funny. can't make up stories like that. No, you really can't. <laughs> All right. So we see, let's throw it open to questions. Should I look, Rachel, or will they be in the chat or do you want to pick some? Rachel moderate? David and I have been compiling some, and I think David okay. has the first couple that he's going to go ahead and ask. Right, yes. Uh, there's one here from Tracy. She was wondering if there were any stories that might have been a little inappropriate that you left out because it's a middle grade book. Um, I'm trying to think if there were, and I wouldn't say there were. I think that uh, his book is clear enough and open enough that anything that was uh, an inappropriate story, I really didn't run across any. And yes, we have a lot of funny stories that are sort of scatological. That's part of Indian tradition, uh, but those didn't seem to fit into the book. I fit in what I thought fit in properly. Thanks. Um, there's also a question here from Robbie. He says, uh, is there any documentation as to how uh, Ely felt about the Indian wars in the West? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, because he was in charge of what was then the equivalent of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and he felt that it was important to, uh, as I said earlier, feed, not fight, to provide support for the native people. He felt that the Indian treaties that had been signed over the years were all unfair. All the weight was on the side of the government and every treaty was eventually broken. So he stopped the making of treaties, which he felt was a bad um, practice on the part of uh, European Americans, a way of cheating Indians out of their property, their land, and their rights by making treaties with them, which were never abided by. Um, the one instance where there was uh, a military event during Parker's um, time in that position was when there was an attack on a Blackfeet camp out West. And that is sort of infamous. My friend, Jim Welch, uh, late uh, Blackfeet writer has written about that. And, um, but Parker um, sided with the military. He felt the military was justified in that case, he may not have been right, but I know that he was a military man himself and felt in that case, there was no option. So I'm not saying he was perfect, but in general, his feeling was that people needed to negotiate fairly and honestly with native people and that native rights and uh, native land should be respected. He had spent, as I said, most of his first 20 years as a person who was crusading, fighting hard to maintain Seneca land. And Robbie has um, one more follow-up question, which she'd like to, she was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, some of the clothes and medallions you're wearing tonight. <laughs> yeah, what I'm wearing is called a ribbon shirt and it is cut in the fashion of a buckskin shirt. When we started getting trade goods like ribbons and cloth, we began making clothing. And because ribbons were for women's hair, uh, native men said, no, 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 no. 
we like pretty things too. And we began putting them on our clothing. So the ribbon shirt, as it's called, is sort of like the equivalent of, I guess, a tuxedo. And the colors of it are uh, red for the blood of life, green for the green plants, and black for the color of our, our, our earth itself, our earth, this mother that takes care of all of us. This is uh, a bear claw. It signifies my connection to the bear clan. And I have a little uh, pin here, which is an a hawk, which is uh, made of silver and mammoth ivory that was actually unearthed in Siberia. This was a gift that someone gave to me. And uh, I have a little pin here that says uh, Green New Deal. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then this is a pin from the Seneca Nation. They gave me this when I was out there last year. And I've got a few other things hanging around on my, my shirt, like, you know, storytelling, make peace, things like that. I happen to be an old hippie. <laughs> so Joe, uh, Jim asked about how um, specifically when whites were writing about contact with Native Americans, they would have a lot of different versions of stories from Native American oral tradition and mm -hmm. that they seem to be much more consistent in the oral tradition. And he was wondering how that has factored, you know, how that has worked in your writing. Yeah, uh, the thing is that oral tradition is actually quite reliable. In fact, Native American oral traditions about the treaties that were written usually were more accurate than the treaties were. And people prided themselves on their memories, on remembering things. And in fact, uh, when Black Elk, the famous Lakota man told his story, he told it with two other men sitting with him who had experienced the same events so they could make sure that those events were properly told. When it comes to our traditional stories, the traditional stories have always been told for two reasons. One is to entertain, but the second is to teach. And so the lesson within the story remains consistent. That does not change. You may use slightly different words in some cases, but the lesson is very powerful and very real and very visible. And uh, I remember, oh, back about 30 years ago, was it? I was called upon to testify for the Vermont Abenaki Nation at our fish-in trials. We had deliberately fished without licenses to draw attention to the fact that we were indigenous people, we were there, we should have Aboriginal rights, which we just got this last year. The state of Vermont just granted us hunting and fishing licenses for free. I haven't gotten mine yet, but we got them. And uh, so I was called upon to testify and I testified as a storyteller and told traditional stories that indicated our long tenure on this land, like stories that could be interpreted as going back to the time of the mammoth or back to the time of the glaciation or stories that talk about specific elements in geography with in animal character perhaps in them. And the lawyer for the state of Vermont said, isn't this like a game of telephone where I whisper in your ear, you whisper to someone else's. And then by the time you get around to the end of the circle, it's a completely different story. I said, no, it is not. Because we tell it so that everyone can hear at the same time and everyone can make sure that we're telling it properly. And if we're not, believe me, someone will correct us. So uh, that's one thing I would say about oral tradition. And the way that we have done it uh, more native writers like myself have done it. It's not just to rely on a single text or a single person, but to really make it a more communal understanding of the story. And uh, often people who wrote down our stories were not from our tribal nations, did not speak our languages, and often wrote down partial stories or misinterpreted stories, or uh, perhaps did not understand the story they were writing down and completely rewrote it as a result. And that is not happening with uh, contemporary native storytellers. I think of my friend Gail Ross, a great Cherokee storyteller, who really is, uh, again, telling, not just retelling, but sort of telling back to the strength and the power of the original story as it would have been told and should have been told, as opposed to some of the ways it was written down by non-native people. Long answer for a short question. Sorry but a, a great one. Um, I wanted to ask, Joe, I've always loved what sounded like your daily writing routine. And I wondered if you could tell us all a little bit about what that what that typically looks like for you and then what it's been like, you know, this past year in the pandemic, if it has changed at all, or if you've been able to be consistent in that. 
Well, I'll tell you one thing that is a little different that I didn't used to do. Of course, with the pandemic, I'm staying home all the time, unless I'm like this Zooming with someone. And uh, in fact, I was talking with one of my editors, Jim Perlman of Holy Cow Press, who told me he's gotten more done in the past year than he's gotten the past five years because he's home and able, he actually has to work out his own uh, stuff, uh, editing in this case. So what I do is nowadays, I used to get up and write every morning, but now I get up every morning and I walk my dog. I have a, a brown moyenne, which is a poodle between a you know, miniature and a standard. She's a really great creature. And I take my phone with me. And as I walk along, I dictate into my phone. So every morning I write at least one poem. And every morning I often write a chapter by dictating it into the phone. In fact, I have a new book uh, coming out later this year from Dial, which I wrote entirely dictating it on the phone. It's a book of poetry telling a story. It's a novel in poetic form. It's called Res Dogs. And it's about a, a girl who is uh, stuck literally on one of our Wabanaki reservations in New England during the pandemic with her grandparents. She can't go home to her mother and father who are living in Boston. And uh, this dog comes and adopts the family. And the story is called Res Dogs because the dogs are not just the dog, but the people themselves. Just we're like res dogs. We are our own people. So it's a, a novel in the form of uh, poetry that is coming out later in 2021. I will put a link to pre-order that into the chat in just a moment. Um, yes, we are pretty close. <laughs> yeah, it looks fantastic. I just pulled it up on the Northshire website and uh, I'm excited about that. I hadn't heard about it before. <laughs> Um, we're very close to out of time, so I thought perhaps Steve would be willing to ask one last wrap-up question to sort of pull us yeah. all back together. I always want to start a whole new session to find out about how that works. <laughs> yeah. The craft end of it, like you, you dictate into a phone. Yeah. Is there a lot of revision at that point? Is that, a, is that essentially a first draft? I don't mean to get into a whole discussion. Oh, no. Well, craft you, know, just... you know, let me, let me quote an old friend of mine, a guy named Allen Ginsberg. Alan said to me once, nothing escapes faster than a poem in the night. Hmm. He kept the journal by his bedside. If he'd had one of these, you could bet Alan would have been dictating in it on a regular basis because he used a tape recorder. I saw him once on a plane. We were flying together. He said, oh, here, look what I got here. Bobby just gave, Bob Dylan just gave me this new tape recorder. So we're recording our poems on the plane, but that's another story. In any event, what I think is important about writing often is getting down what you're thinking before you forget what you're thinking. You know how active our minds are. And if we don't write it down now, 10 minutes from now, we might not have that exact wording that we had. So what I get when I dictate it is a really good rough outline. Then I put it onto you know, the computer and I begin to tinker with it and I use it as a template, but I don't really have the first final draft. I've just got to start at it. Hmm. That's awesome. And you have other books coming out this year as well, right? Yeah, I actually have one right here. Oh, It's called Peacemaker. It's a, a novel uh, about the uh, founding of the Iroquois League, told from the point of view of a young Haudenosaunee man who has lost friends and relatives because of the constant fighting. And it's a time when the five nations were all at war and a man came as a messenger from the creator to bring peace. And I think this is a message we need right now. And uh, this book, just came out a few days ago. It just arrived in stores. So that's one of my new books. I also have a new novel from University of Oklahoma Press, uh, Detective Story, which is a sequel to a book of mine called Chenu, the Native American detective. And that's called Paddleskulks. And that uh, is just coming out around now. Going strong. But let, let, me, let me point out, my dear friend, Jane Yolen, is about to publish book number 400. <laughs> I've only got about 170. You got a ways so to go. I'm yeah. way behind, dear old Jane. Keep working. Yeah. You'll get there. You'll get there. Uh, so Joe and Steve, thank you both so much. This has been really lovely and wonderful and great to have the gang back together again. Um, I hope that we can have many more happy nights um, in the bookstore itself with the two of you together. Yes. Um, I look forward to that, but thank you for making the space for us here tonight. Um, audience, thank you for being here. You can order One Real American from Northshire Bookstore if you haven't done it already or your independent bookstore near you.
the um, actual size of the book right here behind me. Exactly, so, it'll fill your mailbox. mailbox. <laughs> um, and please uh, join MLK Saratoga for the wonderful author Jewel Parker Rhodes. Um, you can find, you can reserve a space at that free event at yaddo.org. Um, so thank you everyone and have a wonderful night. We'll see you again soon. Good night everyone. Thank you, thank you very much. This was wonderful. I really enjoyed being on it. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Mr. you everybody. Bye, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. I see you. <laughs> I appreciate it.